In 1994, the end of South Africa's apartheid government and the election of Nelson Mandela was celebrated by South Africans and by the world as an African revival. But 12 years later, South Africa faces widespread poverty, an AIDS epidemic, and continuing racial inequality. Next on Great Decisions, a spotlight on South Africa. In a democracy, agreement is not essential, but participation is. Join us as we discuss today's most critical global issues. Join us for Great Decisions. Great Decisions is produced by the Foreign Policy Association, inspiring Americans to learn more about the world. Funding for Great Decisions is provided by the Starr Foundation, the Morse Family Foundation, the William and Karen Tell Foundation, and U.S. Trust. And now from our New York studios, here is Ralph Beglacher. There was dancing in the streets when the white minority government of South Africa gave up its apartheid regime after 45 years. Under pressure from Europe and the U.S. and from internal movements led by former regime prisoner Nelson Mandela. The peaceful transition from institutional racism to political and social integration was the beginning of what most people thought would be a bright future for South Africa, for its neighbors and for all of Africa. South Africa remains an economic power. Its strong currency and continued industrial and commercial strength remain the envy of much of the continent. And former President Nelson Mandela, as well as current President Thabo Mbeki, are both influential pan-African figures, often taking on the role of trusted mediator in regional conflicts like those in Rwanda, Sudan, and Congo. Both are also respected world figures, unlike many of Africa's leaders. But there's tragic news, too. Though South Africa is ranked among the 50 wealthiest countries in the world, millions of South Africans still live in abject poverty. Many point the finger at the African National Congress, the political party that helped bring down apartheid and has led the country ever since. The ANC is accused of ignoring persistent social, bureaucratic and economic issues, chief among them continued racism, government corruption and a lack of fiscal discipline. Perhaps most troubling is South Africa's AIDS epidemic. An estimated 20% of South Africa's adult population is HIV positive. President Mbeki has publicly expressed doubt that AIDS is even caused by the HIV virus and has suggested the best way to fight AIDS is through economic development. Will South Africa be able to fully capitalize on its economic strength, building upon foundations for freedom and success laid 12 years ago? Or will internal disputes and challenges like AIDS prove to be overwhelming, keeping South Africa from being among the world's economic and political powerhouses? Helping us answer these and other questions are Charlene Hunter-Galt, a South Africa-based journalist who has worked for both CNN and NPR and authored the book New News Out of Africa. And John Stremlaw, Associate Executive Director of the Carter Center and former head of the Department of International Relations at the University of Witzwatersrand in Johannesburg. Welcome to you both. Thank you. South Af Africa since apartheid, has it been met its expectations, met the expectations of the people of South Africa, of the people of Africa, for that matter, the people of the world, surely? Ralph, I think it's a work in progress. I think that, you know, 12 years is a short time in the history of what is fundamentally a new nation uh, with new rules, uh, new leadership, new expectations. And you have to remember that it inherited, the, the new government of South Africa inherited a country that had been oppressed not just during the apartheid era, because that was only 40-some years, but, you know, that goes back 300 years. So while you have uh, great expectations, you have great challenges, and yet, um, you know, the people so far, with some few exceptions, seem to be willing to give the government time to change some of the egregious things that happened during the apartheid era. I mean, you had dual school systems that you had the same kind of separate and unequal that we had here in America before the Civil Rights Revolution. And it's just going to take time commitment uh, and, and resources to change that. The big question is, is there enough time? But so far, so good. John, your assessment, is it, has it met expectations? 
It's more than met my expectations, Ralph. I'm the guy in the 1980s who was predicting a race war in South Africa, which could reawaken racial tensions in this country. That was America's vital interest in South Africa. And in many ways, it's still America's vital interest in South Africa, because what South Africa achieved in the 1990s was to put a capstone on the bloodiest war in human history, most of those wars being fought in origin in, in Europe. And what they did was found a peaceful way forward, something Americans failed to do when they fought the bloodiest war in the 19th century, the Civil War. And it took another 100 years for people like Charlene Hunter Gault to stand up and say, we want basic legal rights. And those light rights were gotten in 1994 in a constitution, which did the amazing thing. It embraced the oppressor and made them part of the guaranteed rights and protections that this great democracy of borning that Charlene refers to, lots of problems, but this great democracy holds as a promise to Africa, shows the world that Africans can, maybe can get a little bit better than we did. Has the rest of Africa been as patient as the South African people have been about expecting the South African economic engine to succeed as powerfully as it once did and expecting the spread of democracy and so on? Well, that's a really interesting question, Ralph, because the South African economy is 40% of the rest of sub-Saharan Africa. And you go around the rest of Africa. I went to the Congo for the elections on July 30th, and the only prominent, cleanly polished-up company that was around was Vodacom. They're putting cell phones all over over Congo. They are doing all sorts of Based things. Based in South Africa. Africa. Based in South Africa, Ralph. They're the biggest investors in Kenya. They have replaced a gun-shy investment community in the Europe and in the United States that isn't giving Africa the kind of chance that South Africans are willing to give the rest of the continent. Now, there's a danger here that they can be perceived as the new imperialists, but I think they're very sensitive to that. They're also very grateful for the help Africa gave them in the freedom struggle. So it's a good partnership, I think. What's interesting, though, is that some of those who are uh, spreading out now that South Africa is no longer what Nelson Mandela used to call the polecat of the world, that they have these opportunities. It's not just white business. It's black business and investors. There are black mining magnates and, and uh, uh, who have spread out into other co countries on the continent, black businesses that are expanding into the continent, and black people involved in, in these companies that John just referred to. So that while you have right now uh, a, a sort of top-heavy group of black people who have moved into the economic mainstream and criticism that more blacks have not been brought up from the bottom, which is a valid I was going to say, criticism. How, how much black entrepreneurship really is succeeding? Well, in the thing is, that's a valid criticism, because you, but, but to just quickly finish my point, increasingly there are more and more blacks moving out of the uh, out of poverty and into the lower and lower middle classes and the government has acknowledged that its program of black economic empowerment their affirmative action is not a dirty word it's government policy so the government has a policy of black economic advancement which it pushes uh, corporations predominantly white multinationals and others to observe that has not uh, filtered all the way down, which is a big challenge, but that leads to the second big challenge, which is that even if you had the opportunities, because so many black South African young people left school to participate in the liberation struggle and missed their formative uh, years of education, they are now out there with no skills and limited education. So that's one of the big challenges. How do you get them into an economic mainstream? That is still predominantly white. I read that something like 10% of South Africans still live for a year on less than a U.S. dollar. Is that... Sure. The majority has a per capita income the same as Congo, and the minority, which is increasingly multiracial, by the way, as Charlene notes, has a standard of living like Spain or Portugal. There's a huge gap. The social and economic gap has to be bridged. But the key to this is education. And what you realize when you look at Africa or you look at the African-American community in the United States is when you have institutionalized racism and a chance for greed to exploit that, that racism into slave labor and denial of educational opportunities, because these people aren't like you and me, you don't get the kind of training and fundamentals that you really need. The Congo didn't get them. 
Black South Africans haven't gotten them. African Americans haven't gotten them. Education is the key. South Africa's universities are now educating much of the elites from around the continent. Three quarters of my postgraduate students at the University of Atbarisran from the rest of Africa. It's that educational gap that will make everything else possible, Ralph, but that doesn't change in a day. Archbishop Desmond Tutu has talked to President Mbeki himself about the successes and challenges of governing and shared his insight with great decisions. I was talking to President Mbeki and saying to him, uh, you are aware, of course, that you have been nom uh, nominated by Time magazine as one of the 100 most influential uh, individuals in the world, uh, but that your 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 star would have been glowing uh, even more and even before i f uh, finished that sentence he said except for two things aids and 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 zimbabwe and i think yeah we we have been less than at our best on those two particular issues so let me ask you about mbeki's government uh, john how's it done well I think it's done remarkably well. Remember, they've got a program that's trying to ensure the independence of South Africa within the international system. This is a liberation group that didn't get much help from the Americans or others in the long struggle. There's a lot of talk, but not a lot of help. So they really want to prove that they can do this themselves. Now, the ANC is very popular, so it has two-thirds of the parliament, but it loses 40 percent of the time in the constitutional court. So long as the rule of law prevails in South Africa, I'm very optimistic about its democracy. Now, the problems that Mbeki mentions, AIDS in Zimbabwe, I can refer to Charlene's book. Her first half of the book deals with the dilemmas facing South Africa in a very balanced way. But these are complicated issues for an easy tele television conversation, Ralph, and it needs some study and some thought. Charlene, what about Mbeki's government in the last... Uh five, six years? Well, I think it's, it's established some good principles. As uh, John said earlier, it has one of the most liberal constitutions in the world. It adheres to the rule of law. Even Nelson Mandela, when he was president, was uh, subpoenaed to testify in a court case. And, of course, people went, were up in arms about it. But he said, no, you know, I'm an average, ordinary citizen when it comes to the rule of law. So he subjected himself uh, to, to that. And I think that while there is, a, as my mother would say in the old days, it can be a big slip between the cup and the lip, at least um, there are principles there. There, there, there are rules of the road that speak against corruption. You know, that's been one of the big bugaboos of all, all of Africa, which, by the way, again, as John pointed out, has been aided and abetted by the West. But you couldn't have corruption without a, co a corrupt tea without a corruptor, but uh, the government has been uh, highly uh, critical of corruption. Uh, it has spoken of the empowerment of women, and even in the area where it has failed the most, in the uh, area of AIDS, um, you know, there, there are, uh, as uh, Dr. Brian Brink from Anglo-American, the largest employer uh, in South Africa, uh, talked about to me um, some months ago. The principles are there, and he compared it to the end of apartheid. He said, you know, apartheid ended and we laid down democratic principles. Now, at least, we have the principles laid down for how you get your arms around uh, AIDS, and we just have to now move towards implementing those principles. Let me ask you this. Was Mbeki the right person to be the second president of South Africa? Nelson Mandela was obviously the right person to be the first president of South Africa, but what about the second president? Well, John can answer that because that calls for an opinion I'm not sure I want to make at this point. Uh, but let me just say uh, for the record that throughout the time that Nelson Mandela was president, Thabo Mbeki ran the government so that there was no one who knew better uh, w what had been laid down in the first years of this new multiracial democracy. Then Thabo Mbeki, who, who is a, as a sort of a, a hands, what would you call it, a hands-on administrator. Uh, but, but, you know... But very you, often, you know, liberation leaders don't always turn out to be the best governors. 
Well, look, at, uh, Mbeki was uh, an overseas emissary for the African National Congress for many years. He's taken the measure of statesmen around the world. Now, for a professor of international relations, he's my guy because he's had the most interesting foreign policy, terribly active in the rest of the continent, really playing a role which someone had to play for the rest of Africa, being the supporter of good governance, which is credible, peace and security, which is cr credible, regional cooperation, which is credible from an African base. He said the right things and pushed the right issues. You can, can say it back home, he's lost touch sometimes with his grassroots. And there is a populism burgeoning up. But you have to put Mbeki in the context of the times. Mandela did bring about the transition. What Mbeki was trying to put in place is a South Africa that can stand on its own legs. And that means it practices an economic policy, which is liberal orthodox and quite controversial. He does it not because he's an ideologue, but because he sees the only way he's going to preserve South Africa's independence is to not make it dependent on the World Bank or foreign aid or other things. And that takes sacrifice and discipline. I think it's also led to some of the problems that the country um, has, has been associated with, like this championing of homegrown remedies for HIV and, and AIDS, and it may have been misguided, but it certainly is a part, I think, of the psychological makeup of this uh, leader who, who has been the champion on the continent and at home for African solutions to African problems. And as, as John said, I mean, the point is I think we can't answer that question that you asked. We can just sort of talk around these points, but we don't know if if one of the other uh, people who might have been in line would have made a better president. But certainly he has helped. Well, whatever criticism you can make of him, the country has steadily moved forward. Now, it's facing real challenges now because the two, the first two leaders of the country are about, well, Mandela has already moved off the political scene and Mbeki will be moving off in 2008. And so the next challenge is going to be, the question is going to be more important for the next president as opposed to, was this the right guy? I just want to ask about, you. both of you have talked about Mbeki's role with other African countries as a, as a reconciliator, as a mediator, and so on. Uh, he's been especially interesting to watch with the neighbors in Zimbabwe and Robert Mugabe. Uh, he's taken a more, I'd say, gentle approach toward Mugabe than the United States has, certainly, and that other countries have. Uh, has he achieved as much as he'd hoped? Do you think he will succeed there? Well, one of the interesting, you, you can answer that too, but one of the interesting things was that uh, Colin Powell, who was then Secretary of State, had publicly uh, challenged South Africa's what they call constructive engagement of Zimbabwe, and he did it uh, here before they came to, Amer uh, to, the, to South Africa. Well, all of us journalists were standing around waiting to ask the President and Becky when they came out of their joint uh, session about this obvious bone of contention between the two countries. And when we asked the question, President Bush just laughed. He said, we don't have any issues on it. Uh, President Becky is our lead person on Zimbabwe. So whatever Mbeki said to, President Becky said to him in the 20 minutes they met, obviously, at least for those purposes, uh, w w w he was satisfied. Even though Mr. Bush had referred to... Uh, Zimbabwe as an outpost of tyranny. At the, absolutely right, and we, and we journalists were all shocked. What because are they going to do about it? Yeah, I mean, I mean that's see, the question. What 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 you have to remember is Mbeki has no good policy options towards Zimbabwe. It is a thorn in his side because it challenges the values he's trying to project in the continent. His first responsibility as a leader is not to divide South Africans, and the land issue in South Africa is a big one because eighty eighty five percent of the land is still owned by the whites, or fifteen percent or less of the population. So he's got to not divide his country. And the black opinion has now perceived Mugabe as not a hero of liberation, but as a power abuser. That has gone on far too long. We all know that. But at the same time, he didn't want to have the West come in and tell him what to do about solving this problem. And I think the Bush and Powell's credit, they realize that this is his neighborhood and he has to find an answer for it, and he hasn't found one. We all know that. The other problem, though, is that the opposition has been weak. It has, it has subsequently imploded. In Zimbabwe. And, in Zimbabwe. And South Africa was never keen on that leadership in any event, even though it did... The leadership of the opposition. Of, of the opposition, the Movement for Democratic Change in, in, uh, in Zimbabwe. And I think that... What what South Africa was trying to do was to try to find the progressive or moderate leadership within 
the ruling party in Zimbabwe, ZANU-PF, to bolster them. Because after all, I mean, whether you like it or not, even in this country, people were unhappy many with the way the election here turned out. This was a democratically elected president. So you can't just simply march your troops across the Limpopo from South Africa and take over. You have to respect the process, even if there were those, including international observers, who said it was flawed. So as, as John says, the options are very limited. You could speak out more, which I think has been the, the uh, unhappiness of a lot of President Becky's critics, that he hasn't beat uh, President Mugabe more over the head, but the options are really limited. We've got to talk about AIDS in South Africa, and you've touched on it, a couple of you, uh, several times, but, but this is a huge, huge problem, it, not only in the country, but in the continent. How Describe the situation in South Africa now. Uh, how widespread is AIDS there? Who's most affected, women and children? Young girls, I think, are 30% of the victims at this point? Well, all over the continent, the face of poverty as well as the face of of AIDS is female, and it's young females of child, uh, uh, teenagers, late teenagers, and 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 young mothers of childbearing age, many of whom are passing on their uh, infections to their young young uh, infants, and so it is a growing uh, problem all over the continent. What's and, it done to South African society? Well, it, you know, it, it's it's been harder on a lot of other countries where the leadership has been decimated. Uh, and, of course, South Africa has lost some prominent uh, people, including uh, the spokesman. Uh, well, we, we won't have to get into who, who's been lost. But it's it's been a terribly divisive issue in the country. It has... Um, I mean, there would be those who would argue, and many do, that the country did not exhibit the kind of leadership that might have uh, enabled them to get up on top of the issue in order to um, to get their arms around it a lot sooner. Well, well, was that's this true? A, was this a big mistake? Well, it probably was a big mistake not to be more outspoken, but again, did he want to hostage himself early on when antiretrovirals were, were really expensive? Becky. And Becky, to the, to, the, to the drug companies of the North. He was being lectured to by the rest of the world, and he's saying, wait a minute, this is our problem, we'll deal with it our own way. I don't think he handled that very well, but what's also happened that is positive is that the civil society and the grassroots have mobilized, challenged us in the courts, the court's decisions have been respected, it does have the biggest... Uh, anti-AIDS program now in the world operating. It could have gone a lot better for sure, but this is a conundrum unlike any government has faced anywhere. And these, this government's come through, you know, the apartheid era. It's the curse of Job. It's come through the apartheid era, and now it's facing uh, huge in in inequalities and poverty, which complicates it. It looks at AIDS and says there's a lot of other things on the equation. Why is the world so transfixed on that? I don't have the answer. I'd like to see it done better. My students were infected, and I had to lecture them, and I'm not a comfortable guy talking to the classroom about sex, but you have to do it. Do you think the world is improperly focusing on that issue in South Africa and Southern not, Africa generally? Look, Ralph, you cannot say improperly it's such a human catastrophe, but malaria kills a lot more people, and that's a curable or preventable disease for which the West does not, or until recently, put much resources in. Credit to the Bush administration. There's more going in than ever before. But tuberculosis, the, the, the ravages of poverty, these are endemic equations that have to be looked at. And if I had just one quick word about what we don't talk about enough about Mbeki and his foreign policy, is the Congo, four million people died, Ralph, and it was the South Africans who brokered a peace solution when the rest of the world wasn't doing anything. South Africans that are providing all the ballots, all of the election materials, making sure that it works, the MONAC, the UN, UN, UN forces. There is a lot of activism which doesn't make it onto the headlines of our normal newspaper papers that students and other informed Americans need because South Africa is so important to America as a, as a, as a compatible democracy on the continent needs to know. I think the AIDS issue is important. I agree with everything that John has said. I think that in the countries where um, there has been progress in um, reducing the infection rate or certainly controlling it, um, like Uganda, uh, w which has stood up to now as a model, although I hear that there are problems now uh, in that country as well because um, there's been leadership that's been critical of the use of condoms. Uh, but th the point is that th even in a government like Lesotho, which is next door to South Africa, 300,000 
people out of a country of, of two or three million are HIV positive. And their government has been given kudos from Stephen Lewis, who is the UN Special AIDS Envoy to Africa, as doing the right things and everything. But their infection rate continues to climb. The critical thing for the international community to join hands with the Africans on is getting people to know their status. Because unless they know their status, unless you can reduce the stigma, this thing is going to continue to grow. And that's where you need leadership from every single level. And there have been issues in South Africa with the um, deputy president of the African National Congress and others making statements that have just helped to confuse the public because taking a shower after having sex without a condom is not going to eliminate the risk of getting AIDS. And this, has, this kind of statement has fed into an already confused public which needs clear signals on how you manage this thing and how you keep it from spreading. Charlene Hunter-Galt, former bureau chief in South Africa for CNN and NPR, and John Stremlaw, associate executive director for peace programs at the Carter Center. Thank you both for being with us on Great Decisions. And thank you as well for joining us on Great Decisions 2007. I'm Ralph Begleiter. To learn more about topics discussed on Great Decisions, visit our website at www.greatdecisions.org. To order a copy of the Great Decisions Briefing Book, a DVD set of this series, or to join a Great Decisions discussion group in your area, contact the Foreign Policy Association. Funding for Great Decisions is provided by the Starr Foundation, the Morse Family Foundation, the William and Karen Tell Foundation, and U.S. Trust.